This episode is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. So let's talk CBD for a minute. It's all over the news, and there are so many PGA Tour players using it, such as Phil Mickelson and Bubba Watson, uh, to name a few. But there are many others, and now some top teachers, including myself, are taking advantage of this amazing product. But what is it exactly? Short for cannabidol, CBD is a chemical compound from the cannabis plant. It's a naturally occurring substance that's used in products like oils and roll-ons to impart a feeling of relaxation and calm and to reduce inflammation as well. Now, it doesn't get you stoned, but it has many organic rejuvenating effects. One of my favorite brands is Enveed. Their CBD products come in three varieties, Relief, Clarity, and Relax. Relief CBD products help relieve pain and those sore muscles. Clarity allows you to focus on those critical shots or whatever the task is at hand. And relaxed CBD products are for those anxious golf moments or those moments in your life when you just need to take the edge off. I would not endorse any product that I didn't use personally, and I can tell you that I've been testing this stuff for over a month now, and it's a game changer. I take a drop of relax right before bed, and it's helped me get some of the best sleep that I've had in years, which for those that know me, I'm up all the time with a busy mind, so it's really, really helped, and I feel so much better in the morning after just getting some deep REM sleep for a change. I also take a drop of the clarity in the morning uh, with my coffee to kind of get my day started, which has given me an alertness and a focus that I have never experienced in my life. It's just unbelievable. I also use the roll-on for some sore muscles and joints after a run or a workout. Right now, I have an incredible offer for you. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the promo code GURU20, that's G-U-R-U and the number 20, for a 20% discount for life. You heard it right, 20% discount for life. Go check it out. I'm telling you, it's a game changer in golf and in your life. Now let's get to this week's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. But like a miniature Buddha, covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it! Now let's do this! Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I'm Jason Sutton and I'm the Guru. I know we're going through some strange times right now with the global pandemic. So I want you to know that my thoughts and prayers go out to all of you. And I hope we can all stay positive through these difficult times as I know we'll come out stronger for it. So stay safe, everyone. And while most of us are going into shelter mode, we may as well connect through FaceTime and the podcast like this one. So I will continue to do my best to bring you the best information that will help bring us all together, but most importantly, connect and communicate with each other, even though we might not be able to get together physically Uh, Thank you so much for the outpouring of DMs and messages regarding the podcast as that really keeps me going and keeps me passionate and motivated to do this show. And also, please make sure you download all the episodes and subscribe so you don't miss any future shows as they drop. My guest on this episode is my longtime friend and student, Mr. Ron Green Jr. Ron is a senior writer for Global Golf Post. He has covered golf for over 30 years, including 90 major championships. That's correct, 90. He is the president of golf of the Golf Writers Association of America and a regular contributor to SiriusXM's golf coverage. You hear him on the radio a lot, on multiple uh, podcasts and also uh, radio shows. Now, there couldn't have been a more perfect time for this conversation uh, in the midst of this professional golf being in a holding pattern. And to get Ron's insights from the tour players that he's talked to in the last few weeks is valuable and also get his take on where he sees golf going forward. And if you listen closely, you might 
here's some possible scheduling ideas that most of you don't know about. Uh, so that's really, really cool. He also flips the mic and asks me some teaching questions as he is a consummate student of the game and one of my all-time favorite people in the, in the world of golf and in life, I must say, as I really enjoyed this conversation that is loaded with some behind-the-scenes looks uh, from my first media guest. So I hope you enjoy this awesome conversation with my good friend, Mr. Ron Green Jr. Enjoy. I'm with Ron Green Jr. Thank you for uh, coming on the show. I appreciate you coming through. How you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. Just uh, living the new normal. Exactly. Yeah. So we were discussing before we were recording that we're in the middle of this global pandemic and how the status of golf is, is we're basically on a holding pattern, at least for the tour and how our clubs are probably as busy as they've ever been. So what is your, what is your take on this whole thing? And, and where do you think golf is at this point? Well, I think it's going to be very interesting eventually when golf restarts, how they're going to take what they've missed and put it into the back end of this, the year, uh, the season, whatever you want to call it. Cause there's a lot that you keep hearing is going to happen, but sure. you don't know exactly. I mean, there's only so many blocks and there's more sort of pieces than there are holes to put them in right now. But I, I mean, it was already a good season and you were just getting to the best time of it. I mean, right. Being down, I was at Bay Hill and then going to the players, which I really like. I know some people don't love it. I think that's a great tournament. I think they built a great golf course for what they wanted. And there was, you know, there was a little less excitement this year because you sort of, it was sort of like when you're on the golf course and you see the thunderstorm coming, you know, I'm never going to get it. You knew there was going to be a shot down. Like I'm on the fourth (laughs) hole. I'm never, uh, you know, I'm waiting for that horn to sound. And so, so you got it. And it's just, and then, you know, when it goes from no, fans on Friday to no golf to no golf for a month to no golf for two months. And I mean, it, it's deflating in a lot of ways. It, it's, you know, it forces us to sort of look at other things and it's amazing how quickly priorities shift. I mean, whether it's toilet paper or, uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? Starbucks, you can't go in there. You can only get yeah. drive through things like that. But I, you know, it seems like we're all adjusting. I know they're trying to keep everybody inside as much as they can, but at least golf courses allow us to get out there, at least right now. Yeah, and you you know, you've talked to a few of the tour players and then how they're they're uh, feeling their time right now is probably interesting too, working out, working at home, yeah, trying to keep their distance, but also trying to get some work in. I mean, I told my son, we, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the, the college season's getting cut short and how disappointing that was. And I said, look, you got – two choices you can sit on your butt or you can go work on your game and be ready when when summer comes or fall or whatever it happens so i know know that's probably a decision a lot of the tour players are making yeah webb simpson was saying that especially how well he's played the last six months or so it was an inconvenient stop for him (laughs) no doubt he's got it going and uh he said he was talking to his wife down on the plane home from ponte vitra about what do i do and he said i'm lucky i have a gym at my house my trainer's here and i'm trying to practice uh, he said, and I'm trying to keep the mindset that if the commissioner were to call tomorrow and say, all right, we're going to restart in a week, I could get ready. Be ready, yeah. Didn't want to fall too far behind. But on the other hand, like Paul Casey, and, and he said, I will take long breaks at times. But when we talked to him just a couple of days ago, he had not even unzipped his travel bag from Ponte Vedra. Oh, Club wow. was still in it. Yeah. And he said, I got a young son. I'm doing this. We're trying to organize like school type activities and other things. And other guys, I mean, Harold Varner built himself a practice range, put in a septic tank. I don't know what that involved, but, <laughs> but it doesn't sound fun, but he did it yeah. and bought himself some, a range picker and all sorts of things like that. Uh, there's, you know, it's just, I think everybody's sort of drift. It's sort of like you're on the dark side of the moon right now, trying sure. to figure out when you get back around where you're going to be. Yeah, so so give us your backstory. I think it'd be interesting for the listeners. I know we've been friends for a long time, and you're yeah, you're one of my students now, which is which is kind of fun. I don't know if hey, you boy, <laughs> boy. Uh, I might have. To, do you have payment plans? I think <laughs> I, I was thinking about it the other day. If my golf game were real estate, I would be a teardown. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but we can talk about that yeah, later. But uh, how did you get into golf? And then talk us through your your story. You know, you're, I, I had a lot of questions about your father. There's kind of a legend in the the sports journalism business, and and what you've learned from him. But give us your your lineage. 
Yeah, well, my dad, sports writer for 60 plus years, uh, covered 60 straight masters. He's, you know, he's not a Hall of Fame fan particularly, but uh, he's in the North Carolina he's in a lot Journalism of them. Hall of Fame. <laughs> he's in the College Basketball Hall, Writers Hall of Fame. He's in multiple ones. And uh, I sort of got it from him, listening to him tell stories about all the things he did and covering sports back when college sports were, were big. And, you know, he would do things like there was a, double-A baseball team here in the 1960s at a place called Griffith Park over in what is now Dilworth. Well, was still Dilworth then, but there are condos there now, but I would go out and he'd do the public address system, and I'd sit in the press box 30 or 40 nights a year and keep my little box score and watch baseball. And I mean, I saw Reggie Jackson and all these guys come through in double-A baseball. That's how old I am. But anyway, I sort of, he loved golf the most and got to cover. There's a great picture, uh, I have somewhere on a phone or somewhere uh, of him in the 1960 Oakmont playoff between Nicholas and Palmer, the bridge that crosses behind the first screen to the second hole over there and mm-hmm. across the turnpike. Those two guys are walking and my dad is walking right behind him. He's like the first guy behind him. And so I, I, hearing all those things and being around and he knew Arnold Palmer well and, and got to know Jack very well. And, and it just sort of led me to it. And, I, you know, I sort of figured how hard could sports writing be. It, it's a little <laughs> harder than it looks sometimes. I bet. Uh, and sometimes it shows that maybe you could work harder at it. But uh, I, I, you know, I, I worked in, from Chapel Hill to Greenville, South Carolina, back to the Charlotte Observer. And I was at the Observer for about 23 years and went to Global Golf Post eight years ago. Uh, it's a weekly digital magazine free at global golf post if you give us your email we'll send you one free every monday yeah it's uh, fantastic and uh thank you and <laughs> uh so now i cover the tour i do about 18 19 tournaments a year i will do fewer this year i think because there are fewer been played, yeah. but i counted up i've been to seven already this year and uh it's somebody said what tournaments you go to i said well i did two in hawaii i did tory pines i did pebble i did los angeles i did bay hill and the players that's they play in good places yeah they do and uh, I don't know if the boss loves my uh, expense reports all the time, but uh, so I get to see a lot of really great golf. I mean, the more you're around it, the more I'm around it. I I, I continue to be impressed, not how far they hit it, because it just that's just otherworldly. But how yeah. good they are around the greens, and how good they are at distance control, and how regimented they are in what they do. I mean, yeah, they have their time, and, and most of the guys from us, from our perspective as journalists, they're really good to deal with. But, you know, all right, give me an hour. I'm going to be over here. And, you know, you stand there and they're hitting pitch shots for an hour. Now, they might stop and talk, but yeah, they you see the work of it. I mean, you see sort of the nine to five part of it when you're out there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So what are some of your favorite stories uh, from your father about the, him covering golf? You told one earlier about Arnold Palmer. Share yeah. that with us, please. Yeah, he uh, in 1958, he the year Arnold won his first Masters, my dad had drinks with him on Saturday night beforehand and then had drinks at breakfast with him on Sunday morning before Arnold won that one. And, you know, they'd struck up a good friendship uh, there. And long afterwards, I have a picture of Quail Hollow's 50th dinner party. They did it like St. Andrews and had these long tables and it was black tie and they had these Quail Hollow silver oak bottles and all that stuff. A nice picture of me and my dad and Arnold there, because uh, you know he was so involved in creating Quail Hollow. When that with the Kemper Open, right? The, with, yeah, and well, that... actually with the creation of the club. Oh, really? Okay, uh, I didn't know that. Johnny's dad uh, talked to uh, Arnold about it, and Arnold said, "If you build this golf course, I'll get you a golf tournament." And sure enough, the Kemper Open. Wow, came. I didn't know that And then Arnold that story. was so ticked off when Dean Beeman moved it to Washington D.C that Arnold put a senior tour event there before there was a senior tour. So it was the second or third senior event played and it was there for a long time. Then I guess the hurricane came through in whatever 89 and they moved it to Piper Glen later. But uh, so, you know, those things, I mean, you know, I, I, my dad tells the story of being at the North South one year, walking into the bar at the Pinecrest, surprise, surprise, <laughs> and hearing a voice one afternoon call him, Hey Ron, come on over and have a beer. And Jack's sitting there. He's down there watching Jackie and like, that's all so those, cool. How come all those things happen to you? you right. Know? And uh, so, uh, you know, just a lot of things like that. I mean, I, I, he's got a lot more stories than that. But uh, just listen to it and feeling it and how much he cared about golf. And, you know, there used to be five majors in golf to me because the Golf Writers Championship was always played at Myrtle Beach the weekend before the Masters. And it was like a big deal because back then, 
people went to Florida and either covered major league spring training or they covered golf and they came, they drove up and they would get 75, 80 big time riders there. It's different now, but, uh, and he always wanted to win it. He finally won it <clears throat> yeah. one year. And I always said, well, it was only one round and you shot 80 and you won. He goes, you should have seen it. It was <laughs> so wet and raining so hard, and, uh, but he's on the, his name's on the wall at the Dunes club. So that's awesome. So what are some of your favorite stories? We can kind of get into your, um, you've covered the Masters for so many years. I and have. I mean, even before like 79, is that what your uh, first Masters? 79, yeah. Yeah. So I think this one, if they play it, I think will be 38. If you cover 40, you get what they call the Masters Major Achievement Award. And wow. they, the the Green Jackets come and actually honor you at the Golf Writers Dinner. We have the week of the championship and they give you a nice, you get your name on the wall in there and they give you a piece of the Eisenhower tree and it's a nice wooden box with all the, it's very, very nice. But, um, the first golf tournament I ever went to in person, I saw Sam Snead win his last tour event, 1965 at wow. Sedgefield. Uh, so, and as I recall, Gary player was playing and the same club has to have at Sedgefield. Now my dad went to interview him earlier. I, but he was Gary player, I guess, but they wouldn't let me go in the clubhouse with my dad. And, uh, so later Gary heard about it and Gary being Gary, I ended up with Gary player shag bag, black leather bag with Gary player stitched in gold. And it, we kept it forever. I don't know whatever happened to it, but it was the coolest thing back when people carried shag bags. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, here's Gary player shag bag. Um, I was later lectured by Gary player when I was a teenager, the Kemper open. He looked at me and said, look how skinny you are, <laughs> my young man. And look at this. You know, American children should all spend a week in jail and eat beans and rice and understand how the rest of the world works. And I just wanted to meet Gary Player, you know? But uh, he was true to himself. So, yeah, I've gotten to do a lot of things. I mean, I've played golf with Tiger down at uh, Cabo, three holes. He was one down after one. <laughs> what was that like? Uh, it was good. It was the opening of his first course, he, course design, and they invited uh, three or four of us to come down there. And uh, so, you know, I, I was actually... I got to take over his Twitter account. I tweeted as Tiger Woods that day. I did. Oh my gosh! I did it at Blue Jack National too. His PR guy, former PR guy, was right there beside me. I'm like, "Is this what you want? Is this what you want?" Yeah, but, you probably had to get it approved, right? But, you know, what Tiger <laughs> goes on his Twitter. Hey, my buddy Ron Green is going to be tweeting for me today and all this stuff, which was really cool. And then, uh, so we got to play. He did a nine hole exhibition. Then he was playing three holes with. Uh, uh, there were four of us. Uh, Bob Herrick from ESPN mm -hmm. and uh, Steve DeMeglio, USA Today, me and uh, Joe Passoff, from, uh, who's a great golf writer, uh, course design guy. Anyway, so we play three holes. And, yeah, it is a little, you know, in, I'd known Tiger for years, but you're standing up there all of a sudden with a club in your hand. Were you a little bit nervous? And I, 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 it's hard I, to pull I it back. I got it airborne. I sent it right. <laughs> I put it in a bunker and made one of the best – I got it up and down from the bunker. I was so proud because I could just see that baby just <laughs> right to right field out of that bunker. Got it up and down. That was the highlight. And uh, the next two holes weren't quite as good, but uh, it was really fun, you know, and uh, just being around him. I got to play with uh, President, not President Trump then, but when Donald Trump bought, uh, what was it called? The Point. Now, mm -hmm. Trump, yeah. Lake Norman or Trump Charlotte. Uh, Jaime Diaz, a uh, now at Golf Channel, and I were invited to play with Trump and Greg Norman, who had built the design of the course. And uh, we got rained out after nine holes, but we played nine holes with them. And, you know, Trump was, he was pure salesman, and he was, Shocking. couldn't have been nice. You know, he's just, <laughs> you know, and he hits it pretty good. But you never really quite have to put it out. <laughs> and, uh, and now granted we're just playing and we're thinking this they said it was going to be private well it was private except for those three or four hundred people who were walking with us i'm like oh geez yeah and uh i remember anytime you hit it within five six feet pick it up that's good pick it up that's good and we're on about the fourth or fifth hole and he just goes over and grabs one of his own i said you know i've never seen you miss one of those <laughs> but the, the the part i remember most was we got a thunderstorm came through Norman got out of there. He was a little chapped at that point because Trump had already started changing the design without asking him. And he shows up that morning and looks around like, ah, oh, geez, now they're best buddies now, but he got over it. But so Trump was waiting to fly out. So he has, uh, three or four of us sit down there in the grill room and he orders like burgers and dogs and he doesn't drink, but you guys have a beer. And we sat there for over an hour with him just talking. Hmm. 
And mostly he talked to Jaime because he knew Jaime and knew Digest. And miraculously, three months later, he was a cover of Golf Digest. But it was, you know, it was fun. I mean, everything about, was he going to buy Dormy? And he said, you know, it doesn't fit our portfolio where it is and all that. Right. To somebody, finally somebody saying, uh, either Jim Dodson, who was there, or Jaime Pine said, so what's the story with the hair? How often do you get asked about it? Trump goes, it's amazing I'm out there today on the range and a woman wants to rub it. He goes, I can show you my pictures in my high school annual. This is my hair. <laughs> but little did I know he was going to go on to be present. The next day I was flying to Newark to see uh, a playoff event. That's actually the one where at Liberty National where Tiger went to his knees when he hit a shot out of pain. I think Adams mm-hmm. got one that year. But uh, as only somebody like Trump would say, Friday when they're leaving, he goes, anybody need a ride to New York tonight? You know, I mean, just what everybody says. And I said, you know, funny, I'm going up there to Liberty National in the morning. He said, well, just hop on the plane, come ride with us. Oh, my we'll gosh. Well, I'm, I live 35 miles away. I'm in my shorts and golf shirt, no computer, no clothes, no nothing. And I should have said yes. Uh-huh, I should have said yes. <laughs> so you had to go home. Went home. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, I saw you, I think, was it last year or a couple of years ago when they built the brand new media center at the Masters? I mean, how how good is that? You've seen a lot of changes, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, that is a fantastic facility. Yes. I was old enough. I'm old enough. I was in the old Quonset hut, which is not even there now. And how's this for, I go to my first master's and, you know, they still had typewriters and uh, sort of like these just wooden, you call them tables, but where you'd put your computer. And uh, my seatmate was Herbert Warren Wynn. I'm like, Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm choking already right here. <laughs> and every afternoon he would come in his little tweed jacket and tell me, Ron, what did you see today? And he'd sit and listen. You know, I'm sitting there. I want to, you want to sound insightful and like, you really, you know. Uh, but so that was pretty cool. Then, so I've been through three media centers, but there is no media center in the world like the one that's there now. Yeah, that was, it's, that was it's crazy. It's embarrassing. I mean, it's just, <laughs> if somebody said, you know, they don't want us to actually go to the golf course. And I said, well, why would you leave? I was going to say. I mean, you have just I mean, locker rooms, and uh, it's it's really, really nice. Yeah. Talk about your, your basically your typical week and, like, the process of you covering a tournament, because that's fascinating to me is mm-hmm. do you sit there and watch the computer, or do you actually go walk on the course? I know you'd probably do a little bit of both. Yeah. Like, take us through your week and how you sort of – like, what – I just – I'm interested in the process of how you how you get the story and then how you put it out. Um, it varies week to week, some weeks, and I've tried to do it some this year, like I would go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and maybe come back on Thursday and just get some stuff and not necessarily stay and build everything around who wins that week. Mm-hmm. Other weekends, other times, uh, I will go Wednesday and be through Sunday and basically go, I know I'll write my Monday column off what's happened or, you know, usually if it's a compelling winner, I, I will admit there, sometimes you'll see some names on the leaderboard and like, no offense to Nick Taylor at Pebble <laughs> Beach, but that was going to be a hard one to write. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were some other things. You find other stories. So it, it varies. You know, you if you're there early enough, like on Tuesday and sometimes on Wednesday and Pro-Am, if you know guys, you can go out and walk with them a little bit. We were fortunate through the years to go walk with Tiger a lot. And it just, you know, that would be great fun, just getting him to – he's just – he knows a handful of us. And he could just relax and just talk crap to you about whatever. And, uh, but so you get that, but then on tournament days, I will almost always go walk nine holes at least with somebody or some go in the morning. If I don't have to do something specific that day, I might Mm -hmm. go out in the morning, then go find somebody in the afternoon. And on the weekends, definitely, uh, usually come in after nine holes on Sunday and, um, sort of watch what's happening. Usually I have other things I got to start working on. And if, depending on where you are, how easy it is to get there. Like if, if they're playing at Quail Hollow, it's easy from the media center to walk out of the 16th tee and watch the last three holes right. or something and do it. But other times, you know, the masters, you really, really want to be out there. Yeah. The, but think just about, to feel it, right? Yeah. But just think about last year. I mean, it's happening in so many different places and you could be one place and think you've seen the most important thing and something mm-hmm. else has happened. You don't know Molinari's done this or you don't know Tiger's done that. And, uh, I did, I, just like I did in 1986 when Nicholas was going to win that Sunday afternoon, I went to my dad and I said, 
we're not going to be able to see, but we can't be in here. We just got to walk up the hill and it's right. easy to walk up the hill from where we were then and being out there. And I could see him from his shoulders up and all that. So with Tiger last year, I knew I wasn't going to be able to see. I told somebody, I said, I went out to listen to Tiger win the Masters because that's about all I could do. I mean, I yeah, had to be to, there. There were so many people. I mean, it was just an amazing number of people. And I guess partly because it was the early finish too. It was the strange time and it was mm-hmm. Tiger. And I remember later after he'd won going out to the parking lot and sitting with Joey LaCava, a couple of us talking to him. He had the 18th hole flag stick in the car and that you could hear them taking Tiger to the media center. You could hear the people cheering him. And it's like, okay, there's our cue. We need, probably need to get back there. But just toward the, it was a vibe like you just never had before because you never thought you were going to see it again. And then, so if you're on, if you're on property, do you go, then you go into the media room and get to ask the questions. Yeah. You're now, that well, guy, right? So you get to actually, yeah, there, I some, probably don't ask as many as other people, but they're, you know, personalities being what they are. There's some guys who love to ask questions and, and I mean, I ask them plenty, but, uh, like that one was such a major, I mean, that was like yeah. an international event there. You didn't have to ask for it. They're all, you know, lined up now. And here, if you ever see the interview room on TV at Augusta, I mean, that's an auditorium below the auditorium we work in. Mm-hmm. They don't, they aren't called workrooms. They're called auditoriums. And they are, they're sort of sloped like a, like you'd go in to listen to a lecture. And that one's really a TV studio in a lot of ways and uh, permanently mounted cameras and all this. And the member who sits up there and moderates the press conference, they, in our badges, they have some sort of computer thing and they're each seat at all the tables in that auditorium has a microphone. And when you sit there, that microphone reads your badge and the member sitting up there has a screen that tells who's sitting everywhere. So he knows who, who so is he asking can, the question. Say, uh, yes, Jason, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, it's the, the, all sorts of things like That's that. That's how we got in. Me and my son got in that one year because I knew one of the members, and he gave us that behind the scenes. Yeah. I was like, this is incredible. It is. Just where it is in the background is so cool, right? You yeah. see on TV. And he gets to actually do that and interview some of the players. So do you get to do some of those interviews at, at the end of the tournament or are you just basically just sort of taking things off of what you hear? Well, and- you get, they have a place. The only thing that is not real convenient there is they don't have what we would call a flash area the, where if, when the tournament's over or a round's over, if you're not going to the main interview room where you go talk to players and mm-hmm. they set up little, the little backdrops you see with CBS sports or NBC and all the golf channel, all those, they have a little, every tournament has a little, almost walkway they go down uh augusta has struggled with that i know they are going to solve it in quite the augusta way in a couple years uh but so you you go over there and they bring the players out and it's it's crowded but yeah you can talk to them right there just uh you know they have somebody who's standing there taping it so they can transcribe it for you you never really have to take your own notes it it all just by the time you get back from the flash area the quotes are already right there for you if you need them. Uh, so yeah, you can get them and you, you can request certain players. And even if they're not some, you know, if you just got a local, it's really great yeah. for, you know, somebody from Kalamazoo, Michigan has qualified and the local writers there wants to talk to them. They set it up and you can do that. They, they, they do a very good job. I mean, as you would imagine at the masters, they, every detail is accounted for. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, not only is it a tradition unlike any other, I mean, it's an experience unlike any yeah, other. Yeah, I agree. Spoiled being able to go down there every year, yeah. being so close. We forget how close being here we are. I and, know. It's amazing. Uh, it's just like, because I'll have a, you know, I'll wear a master shirt somewhere and somebody says, have you been there? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Well, like yeah, we I think just, everybody's been there, right? We do. Like, although I haven't played yet, which hopefully is coming soon. Um, I've been around that place hundreds of times yeah. it's amazing hopefully coach there someday that's my next goal that would be good it's i need to a, get a player yeah you need to get one it's uh i mean as many times i've been there there's not a day goes by that i don't walk out there and you just look at it it just it's amazing it's like looking at those cliffs at like seven and eight at pebble beach no matter how much you look at them you don't get tired of looking at it mm-hmm. that's the way augusta is has there been a better comeback do you think in, in the history of sports than tiger i it's hard to man i know hogan had one uh right i i was lucky 
three or four years ago at the Bahamas at his tournament, I'd gone down there and it was in Tiger. Tiger had already had an early week press conference and basically said, this may be it. And said, I think his comment was, whatever happens from here is gravy. And I was not there that day, but I went down and uh, I talked to his PR guy and said, I'd love to get a minute or two with him. He told him, so I'm standing out there on Friday or Saturday and Tiger rolls up in a cart. I just purely by chance where I'm standing to hop in. So I spent 30 minutes riding around talking to him and he wanted to go. He, at that point, it must've been 15 or 16. He had never watched Jordan Spieth play much. He said, I'm going to go watch Jordan play a little bit, but we just sitting there telling stories, but he was, I remember he would grab the steering wheel and try to pull himself forward and stretch. I said, so like right now he goes, it hurts right now. Wow. He said, it's uncomfortable. And you could see him just trying to move and, yeah. And you, you wondered like, okay, this, when you've tried that back surgery three times and it never took, you've kind of figured, uh, I sort of not resigned myself to the fact he wouldn't come back, but sort of made peace that, okay. And I've gotten to see him play all this. And if it never happens, it never happens. But then to come back and do that and the win there. Uh, yeah. That just, that, that was in tears. I I mean, I was uh, literally, my son's looking at me like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, you don't even understand. When I went like back we've and, all been through it with him, right? I mean, right. it's just kind of, this is amazing. I you, never thought I'd see it again. And when you watch the replay of that final round, I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot Dustin Johnson was right there. I mean, Kepka's right there. Molinar's yeah. right there. Fien- they're all, you can't like suddenly has the lead. And he's like, so much happened, but you just sort of took it right into him. Yeah, it was amazing. So growing up or coming up through the business, like who were your heroes who were your mentors that maybe helped you be a better writer or better a better journalist who, who are some of those people well obviously <clears throat> obviously my father yeah <clears throat> excuse me yeah i think still if i write it, it's like playing rounds ago some days you play better than others and you yeah. know when you've written something you really like and uh so i always like to get that nod or that you know, every once in a while he'll call me, and I'm very proud of him when he does because it means he's figured out the iPad again, and he, he found it. <laughs> That's great. Uh, he'll say, "Hey, that was really, really good. Uh, that was hard to write." Da da da. So I, you, you always sort of uh, really appreciate that approval. Um, you know, I'm like everybody else. I mean, I re- grew up reading Dan Jenkins, uh, but you couldn't. Everybody tried to see could I replicate what he does, and you couldn't. I was lucky. My dad knew Dan. And I got to know him through the years, and <clears throat> you know Dan covered how two hundred and thirty some straight majors or something. Wow! I don't know how many golf shots he saw in the last fifty of those majors because he was always in the media room. But I mean, that was, you know, that was Yoda or whatever. You you just wanted to go hang around Dan. And he was wait, the guy. Wait for him to say something, Dan, like, and he always would. And uh, so you learned a lot from him. I mean, you know, Rick Riley's great at what he does, and gotten to know him some, and. Uh, have pictures of us playing North Barrett together. And, uh, you know, you, you couldn't duplicate what he did either because they're, they're different. Uh, Dave Kindred is just, to this day, fantastic. Um, doesn't write much, but when he does, um, I remember I got to have dinner with Jim Murray at a U.S. Open at Olympic Club uh, in a hotel. My parents and some others are having dinner, so I got to meet him. Uh, didn't know him, but... Uh, God, he was, he just, he had it. Um, so, I mean, those are ones who come to mind to me. The Jaime Diaz, to me, uh, I always refer to him as the gold standard. And we were at a tournament a few years ago. And uh, so we end up going to have dinner, my wife and I and Jaime. And uh, so I finally make the introduction. Oh, Tamara goes, oh, you're the gold standard. Ah, uh-huh, because you've said that <laughs> yeah, before. I said, yeah, he's the yeah. gold standard. He is just. That's so cool. He can. Mm, he's really great. So, so what does that mean? Like what, like I know everybody, I'm always relating it to obviously teaching golf and everybody has their own style, their own personality. Like how did you develop that style? And like, I know you said you, you try to model people until you, I think it's the same way with golf instruction. We're always trying to model other people that we respect, but then you have to sort of be you right. Or develop your own, own thing. How does that look to you and how, how did that come about? I think it just came about through whether you call it practice or just doing a lot. Repetition, right? You finally sort of figure out who you are and what you want to be. I mean, sometimes 
like, okay, I'm, I'm going to push this a little bit. And those are the ones you'd like to have. You don't have to punch the button right then. Let me go back and read it tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I'm glad I didn't send that. <laughs> or, oh, that was pretty good. Uh, sometimes you write one in a hurry and like, God, that worked. But, uh, you know, you, you just, you do sort of develop your own style. And, uh, you know, like I read Jaime and he's so cerebral and thinks on a different level than I do. Um, yeah, I remember my dad always said what he tried to do was take people where they couldn't go and give them a sense of what it was like there. And, and granted with television and all the other things we yeah. have now, it's, you get so much of everything now, but you know, try to, try to give them a little sense of what it's like to be there and, and what it feels like and how you feel. And it's funny. Some of the things I'll write that I think are really good and you don't get much response. Then you write something else. And I mean, I wrote one about, uh, just golf stopping. Uh, it was my Monday column after the players ended and I got a ton. I mean, I thought, well, this is pretty good. Uh, but I mean, I got a lot of reaction. I mean, like poor, like bad reaction. No, good reaction. Oh, okay. I I was going to say like, Guy I know who been golf because said you had me in tears. I'm like, well, that was not the goal, but thank yeah, you, yeah. you know. But right. So, but it's gratifying when you hear that. Uh, you know, it's less so now, but used to be, especially when I was at the Observer in the heyday of Tiger. I'd write about Tiger all the time because he sold newspapers, people read sure. it. Sure. But boy, he just okay. I'm gonna write about Tiger. Let me hit that email box tomorrow morning. You'd get the hate mail. There you go again. Oh there yeah, because everybody wants. Yeah, it's the same way with television, right? Right. And that was kind of one of my questions too, is like, what are some of the, the do's and don'ts? Cause I, I listened to, I, you know, I, I listened to interviews with like Costas and, you know, leaving and McCord and now uh, the new guys coming in were Faldo. And it's like, they talk about, well, I shouldn't have said this, or this is what I'm trying to do. And I mean, it sounds like you're trying to paint a picture obviously, yeah. but what are some of those do's and don'ts that you sort of live <clears throat> by as far as writing or covering a tournament? I'm still old school enough. And there's a whole new school generation, and it sort of erupted during the President's Cup a little bit, but that we're not supposed to be the story. I mean, we can tell the story, and as when you're writing columns, you can inject uh, your opinion, and you know you can write about yourself sometimes, and and that's a, that works sometimes, but uh, you know, not all the time. There's a reason they have your name and your picture up there. We know who you are, uh, <laughs> and but you know. Some people now, it's all about not so much the journalism I grew up with, and maybe that's become a thing of the past. I, I don't think it has. I just think it's the way you consume it. But, you know, people who just want to be out there and make it about themselves. And, you know, I'm not, to borrow a line from Jim Nance, who happens to be like my second cousin or whatever, uh, I did a long profile on him, and he says, I'm not a hot take guy. And, and I'm not a hot take guy either. I, I think... You know, I listen to, you know, I can listen to Tony Kornheiser give me hot takes all the time because he does it in such a funny way. Sure. But <clears throat> that's not who I am. Uh, sometimes my hot takes, I'd wish I'd, you know, be like, ugh, that was not a very good You've got to walk a line, don't you? You I mean, do. You really, I, that's, I think that's what but I'm hearing. you want to be fair. And sure. I, 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 that's something my dad always talked about. And talking to coaches through the years, once I sort of followed what he was doing and would cover a lot of guys who he covered, uh, they always talked about being fair. And, you know, your dad's very fair to me. And uh, that's what, you know, and if you screw something up, you go tell them. And, you know, most people cut you some slack if you, you know, I've seen too many guys in the business get all bent out of shape when somebody calls them out on something like, well, you know, they might be right. Yeah, as long uh, as it's accurate, right? Yeah, and like, that's like, the big thing, there right? There have been times like, you know, like, oh, yeah, I should. Yeah. And I'll go say, I, I sort of messed that one up. Yeah. But uh, Plus yeah. you want them to talk to you next time too, right? Right. And it's amazing how... <laughs> To a person, they say they don't read anything, but boy, you write something negative. They'll let you know, won't they? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So, so uh, you had a few topics that you were that you had texted me early on. I mean, what do you what would you like to talk about? I think we can go in a lot of different directions. I had one one of them I was going to ask you about was the the big thing before the slowdown here was the ball, right? The rollback. I mean, yeah. what do you think? I mean, what what's been the vibe out there amongst the tour players and like I, t- I actually talked to Webb about th- about this, and I'll maybe share that on when he comes on the podcast. What's your mm-hmm. thoughts on the rollback? Should they slow the ball down? Well, I mean, I was standing out there at the 18th hole at Aaron Hills on that Saturday when Justin Thomas hit three wood, three wood 
to a 660 yard par five. And I'm like, Hmm, that's different. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but, but the ball doesn't go too far. I, in some ways, and I think I wrote a column about this, and in some ways it feels like the unsolvable problem because take every consist, constituency, whether it's the USGA and the RNA, whether it's the PGA Tour, whether it's ball manufacturers, club manufacturers, they all have a valid argument. Titleist doesn't want to change the ball. Look, we're, I mean, no. why do they want to mess with it? Jay Monahan tell you, wait a minute, I just got... I'm making $12 billion over the next nine years. Something's good about our product. Uh, I don't need to change that. But then, you know, uh, as somebody said, the tour is negotiating uh, for a FedEx Cup playoff event with a great old golf course that wants to host it. The tour has one stipulation. You have to build 14 new tees. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I, I think you, uh, I think I made a text, put this in a message to you. I don't know that the players are as they're skilled at what they do. The artistry is not what it used to be. I think it's yeah. a different game. Well, uh, it has to be right. Cause the equipment, yeah. that's another one is the, it's the equipment and the golf ball. Yeah. Right. I, 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 it's a real thing about, I think the sustainability and how big golf courses can be because you just, it, at some point you just can't keep going. I don't think if they stopped it right here, would that be okay? I mean, I could see it coming back. I don't think ultimately I would have a problem with bifurcation. Uh, yeah. You know, Rory has said that. And I don't really think that what I'm playing is what Webb Simpson's playing. Now, I got a bag full of Titleist clubs, but what Webb's hitting is a little different sure. than what I'm hitting. Yeah. It's like Jimmy Johnson might drive a Chevrolet, but <laughs> when I go down there to buy one, it's not going to be the one he's driving. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think it's sort of bifurcated anyway. I mean, and somebody said, we never put it out anyway. You know, you get it a foot away from home, somebody knocks it away. We play different rules anyway. So I don't think, I've sort of come around to thinking, okay, they could bifurcate. And I really don't think it would make that much difference. Yeah, I think it goes back to like the, the belly putter, the anchor ban. I just don't like anything that's going to hurt the average golfer. You know, because right. again, we're from the teaching side. I'm, I'm teaching, I'm trying to get my, my players, my club players to have more fun. Mm-hmm. And that would be definitely something that <laughs> nobody's ever said. You're the telling game, me I'm hitting at 230. Now you're telling me I'm going to hit at 215. <laughs> you nobody's know? ever said the game's too easy. <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I think yeah, bifurcation is definitely an option. I just think they need to make golf courses tighter with with deeper yeah. rough. That's the only, that's really their only and you know make the green slick and yeah. as they do anyways. But I think that's probably their only the only way they're going to keep the guys from just tearing it up is. Yeah, I think make them hit it straighter. Yeah, I think design. I mean, I love Augusta and a lot of golf courses. I don't know if I like one anymore, and I like watch, walking around Riviera and look at the, and the. But the best players in the world at Riviera and whatever they shot eight or nine under par. I mean, mm-hmm. that golf course gave them what they need. Now they had ideal conditions to make it difficult. The greens were sure. firm, uh, but that's what design can do. And if the wind blows just a little bit at Harbor Town. 10 under par is going to win you a whole lot of money and maybe a plaid jacket down there. So it can be done. Uh, but you know, at some point, yeah, I think there's gotta be a, an increased penalty for if you hit it that far and you missed the fairway, your penalty should be more severe than if you hit something two sixty out there and miss it. Uh, and, you know, I think they've tried to do that in some places and the tour has tried to put flags, you know, barely on greens. Right. That's the other, that's the only other way they can. But the players are so good too. I mean, they're it's amazing. so good. Yeah. Who's your favorite, who's been your favorite person to cover? Who do you think's best with the media? Um, you can go old and new. Well, I mean, Jack Nicholas. I mean, you know, if you could get him on your podcast, it might last nine hours. That would be amazing. He's. He's Since just, I actually named my son after him, there you, <laughs> you go. know, and Nicholas and then Palmer is his middle names. Really? There oh yeah. Go. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's fantastic and, uh, just, you know, not afraid to sit down and talk and share his opinions. And it's amazing if you can, if he won a golf tournament and you could ask him about a six iron, he hit on the 14th hole on Saturday, he can tell you about that shot. But if he didn't win that tournament, he doesn't even remember playing in it. So he says, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me. He didn't win. King don't of the short term memory. Yeah, don't, 
but you know, and he he's been outspoken about the ball thing for a long time. So he's yeah. great, and I love going up to the mower, and you get to be around him, and uh, gotten to spend some time with him, and that's really cool. I remember when he opened Longview here, I was doing a story on him, and uh, so they were going to do the whole exhibition and play nine holes or whatever. Yeah. And my dad and I met him in the cart shed out there, and again, he'd known my dad forever, and so we sat there for forty five minutes talking. I mean, and I'm like. I finally said, you're supposed to be out here. No, no, it's all right. Let's just, just, no, no. <laughs> we're in no hurry. Priceless. And he just had stories he wanted to tell him to talk. So I go out there and my sports setter standing out there. He goes, man, we've been out here all morning. Did Nicholas just get here? I was like, no, <laughs> he's been here a long time. Oh, I see. You've been over there talking to him. I said, it was great fun. Uh, I remember 1999, the first U.S. Open at Pinehurst. And we were trying to do this giant thing at the Observer, a special section, all this stuff. And we wanted to get somebody to take, we were going to do the 18 holes, hole by hole, get somebody's voice to tell us about Pinehurst number two. Turns out Nicholas is doing an event at Longview, which had not been built, but it was uh, for investors and you mm-hmm. know the initial members and all that stuff. So I go out there and tell him what I want to do. And so he does a little bit of his members and Jack being Jack and the thing. And goes and sits down there and takes me shot by shot around Pinehurst number two. Oh I'm, my gosh. I'm feeling awful. Like I'm taking up all the time. And he's just, let me tell you about this. Da, 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 da. And I was like, and so I remember going like my buddies in Greensboro and Raleigh. Who got, who did your hole by hole? Da, 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 da. Well, I got this guy, that guy. They said, who'd you get? I said, Jack. And they're like, huh? And, said, <laughs> and it was really good. Oh my gosh. So he's great. And I nowadays, uh, Rory is just, He's he's really good, isn't he? He's really good in yeah. every way. So honest and just seems uh, like he's just yeah, he's just authentic, right? That's a that's the right word for it. He yeah, is, he's just Rory, and he's grown into it. I mean, he he is he knows sort of his place in the game, and he's got you want to say strong, but he has opinions. He's not afraid to voice them, and and they carry weight. I mean. You know, I mean, just go back to the other guy who will speak his mind is Brooks Kepka and understands that he's in a place where he can influence what's going on. And when Brooks said the other day about the Premier Golf League that he called Rory after Rory's comments, when Rory said, I don't want to be part of that, I don't like where the money's coming from, I want to be on the right side of history, Kepka called him and said, I want to talk to you about that. And then Kepka comes out and says, yeah, I'm, I'm out too. Yeah, that's not- But that tells you how those guys look at Rory. I mean, that's not going to happen, is it? No. No, there's, there's not, I don't think there's any chance. If you're, <clears throat> if you're trying to get the top 48 players in the world and one, two, and three have already said no thanks, and Tiger's going to be 46 or 47 before they start, Phil's already getting ready to turn 50. I, yeah. I just, they might, the players might be able to leverage it somehow to get the tour to, uh, they would like smaller fields uh, in some places. They, they will get something out of it. Uh, but it's kind of what the World Golf Championship yeah. sort of fills that void, don't you think? I mean, I, I think, but I don't know if not, the World Golf Championships. I think they get the players' attention because of the yeah, money and all right. that comes with them. I don't know that the general public, when they watch them play in Mexico City, thinks, "Well, this is this is really special." I don't think they see yeah. it as any different than Wells Fargo or Memorial or something like that. But um, you know, I, I think the more you can get the good player, the best players together, the better. I and I was never a fan of the whole four man team thing. I don't. I like team golf is really good one time a year. Yeah, one time every two years. The Presidents Cup is getting better, thankfully. I was going to say, let, talk about the Presidents Cup. Did you go to the Presidents Cup I did this not year? Go this year. Oh, that's a shame. I, I think this was one I, of the best ones. Yes, and I want. I would love to have seen that golf course. I talked to. That looked so good. Webb and other people, I said it was as good as it looked. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's just spectacular. I mean, just pure golf and just, just a, what a test, you know. And my buddies who played it the day after said, you just can't believe how hard it is on around those greens and getting it up and down there. And so I would have liked to, I've been to multiple President's Cups and it's going to be great when, uh, unless something gets postponed when it's here next year. And uh, I, yeah, think, let's hope. I think it will really the tour will really do a good job of sort of blanketing the city with it. I mean, it, you're going to know it's here. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be good. I know they just got the new teaching building out at quail. Yeah. I've been out there and did a, a tour. And then one of the assistants kind of took me through kind of where the stands are going to be and how the range is going to be set up. It's going to be super cool. And the, you know, change the routing a little bit for match. Play. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell, tell Can you share that with the yeah, listeners? I mean, it's yeah. It's been out there. Yes. Yeah, so because, 
you know, only like 20% of the matches ever make it at the 18th hole. Makes sense, though. Yeah, so they're going to play the first one, two, what, eight holes. Then they're going to skip from the eighth green. They're going to go over to 12. and play. So 16, 17, and 18 will be 13, 14, and 15. Right. Then they will play, what, 10, 11, 9, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 10, 11, and 9 if they get that far. But all the, that way they can build all the grandstands around the green mile and all that. And it would be a great uh, match play thing. Yeah, I, the uh, international team's getting better. You know, I mean, the American team would be stacked. Tiger has not said if he's coming back as captain or not. I, I doubt he will. But uh, I tell you, that, that was uh, <clears throat> it's kind of the evolution of Tiger, right? I mean, I think that sort of goes along with what we were talking about earlier is just how he's he's a different Tiger now. Right, going through with you know with his kids, it's great. You know, after he won last year, I mean, it was so cool to see his kids be there to see him win. And I mean, he's just a different guy. And now he's sort of like back in the day when he was dominating, he was keeping everybody at arm's length. Right, he's kind of in his own little bubble. Now he's like JT and all these guys are his buddies. And I think that just really they, they really embraced that team atmosphere, which was so cool to see. I think so. I think they love playing for him. Yeah, it, there's no doubt. And they love being able to needle him, and he takes it. And, uh, you know, he's good about that. And, you know, you can poke fun at him, and uh, and he's okay with it. But it would be great if he would be the captain one more time. I I, I know they've got this whole process. They're wanting to get guys right. ready for this. You know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if Zach Johnson is the captain here. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if. Jeff Ogilvy's the captain for the European, uh, the international team, which would be great because from a media standpoint, they don't get better than Jeff Ogilvy. He's brilliant. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have all those players. I mean, the JTs and the, you know, the Adam Scotts. And it's, it'll be really, really fun when they have that here. Yeah. Because it's so different. It'll be five minutes from my place, which is going to be That's good. awesome. I'm really sad that the Wells isn't going to happen this year. That's always a great week for us yeah. to – you know, with our members, I mean, we had Hootie and the Blowfish coming in concert. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's being canceled that that was going to happen. So, but, you know, we'll get through it. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, again, we're going to be better for it in the back end and golf will survive. Yeah. You know, we were playing all the what if games. So <clears throat> if this thing really gets pushed back, does say they did postpone the Ryder Cup, which I don't think they're going to have to do, mm -hmm. and moved it to 21. Does that move the President's Cup to 22? Does that bring the Wells back here next year instead of to Avenel? Oh, so I, that's a know, good, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I think we're getting ahead. we, we got to get back to the just another tournament before yeah. we worry about all Is that. Is the Masters going to be in the fall? It sure sounds like it. I mean, I... Where are they going to put it? Like, uh, where's the where's the gap? I think it's the second... I don't know what they have scheduled. Well, of course, they haven't released the fall schedule. But, sure, sure. Uh, I think it's the second week of October. I keep, you know, you can read the stories about the hotel rooms and all this stuff. And I was uh, told today that Reynolds Plantation had a an AJGA event scheduled there the second week of October. And they called the AJGA and said, we had to clear our calendar for that week. Mm. Like, hmm, what a coincidence. Okay. All right. So I heard it here first. Uh, so of course, <laughs> you know, Augusta will tell us all in good time when, yeah, yeah. when they're ready for us to know, they'll let us know. I mean, you always want to see the masters now in October. That could be pretty cool. Now, just, it, just different. It, enough. it will be different for sure. And then they'd come back seven months later and do it all again. I know that would be actually really cool. Cause you, after the masters, you're like, I can't wait for next year. And but could you imagine, I mean, if, if they get this all, scheduled out the way they they talk about it and if they get the u.s open played on time and it's not going to be played i can't imagine at wingfoot mm. i would not be shocked if it was played driving distance from charlotte uh there's a really good u.s <laughs> open test <that's, laughs> yeah that you wouldn't have to do much to uh, yeah you know, I, I know that's at least out there okay uh, so we'll see uh, another one um they're talking about moving the PGA to the week of when the Olympics would have been. So they play at Harding Park in, October, in August. And then you'd have the FedEx Cup playoffs. You've had the Ryder Cup. You'd have the Masters all, I mean, from July through. People are just going crazy. Well, I don't know what we're going to do about the Open Championship because yeah. now they just shut down all travel to the UK. Yeah, yeah I know. That would be crazy coming out of it, though, you know, with that all would, that in one little short burst. That would be a lot of golf for a lot of guys. No kidding. So 
you can be sort of the co-host here. You can ask me questions. I mean, if um, any, I know you had some some things you wanted to, yeah, to discuss. Yeah. I mean, we're open for anything here today. So, when you're teaching now, how, and you've been teaching how many years? 27, 28 years. How much of what you teach now is different from what you sort of grew up learning? Or I know talking to Dana through the years, I'm like, mm-hmm. what I grew up being taught and what happens now is not the same thing. Is it the same for you? I mean, have you gone through that? No, it's definitely evolved. It's a, it, it's way different. Yeah, I think it, it, and that's a great question because I ask that a lot to, to my older uh, teaching teaching uh, pros that I have on the show. I'm like, what did you used to teach maybe that now you know maybe wasn't as accurate as we know now? Because with the technology available now with, you know, TrackMan and 3D and, you know, we know exactly what the club does. We know what the body's doing. We know, you know, we know what the ball's doing. We know what collision of, of impact is and what's what's happening. My information's changed a lot. I mean, I think it's, again, it's you only know what you know, right? And before when we just had 2D video, that was always that we could just see, right? Now we can actually measure exactly what, what's what's going on, as I call it, sort of fact versus fiction mm-hmm. teaching, um, which is I think is is a good thing because it's really streamlined the information and it's made it again. It just made it more accurate. So I mean, I, I, I my style's changed a lot. Obviously, I mean, you just like you like you in writing, like you just evolve mm-hmm. and and you just sort of figure out how to do things better and you know, you make a lot of mistakes along the way and then you try not to do that again or you've learned more about people. Um, I think, you know, the the next frontier, I guess the new thing is just about the brain, right? How people think and how people learn, which is people, you know, that, that's a difficult thing to learn, right? I mean, it's it's tough to measure and they're, they're coming out with a few devices to kind of get in there, but that's just for me, that's, that's my superpower is being able to read people and build those relationships and do that kind of thing just my experience. Right. But I mean, it's, yeah, I'd say it's changed a ton. It's, it's interesting you say that about Dana cause I got uh, several people that I teach now that I've been teaching for almost 20 years. Right. And then they'll, they'll come to me and say, Hey, oh, you remember, I remember you telling me this a long time ago at Dana's. I'm like, well, that may not have been the best thing. It was a good, it was a good idea. Then. <laughs> it was a great idea. Then my, my thoughts have changed a little bit. Sort of like those flowered neckties the guys wore about 20 years ago. They exactly. Were okay at the time. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, I, I definitely, and I'm not afraid to say that I feel, I mean, I, I hopefully my students appreciate the fact that I'm always learning and, and continuing to try to sharpen the, sharpen the saw. You know? But yeah, it's changed a lot. I think. Do you fit, you're not a one size fits all type. You you no, fit not at the all. game to the person. Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 an individual type of situation. Yeah, you're dealing with again. It's like everybody's got different personality, different learning styles. Their bodies can do different things. They're shaped differently. Like there's not one method for everybody. But that's the genius in the coach is to be able to push those that individual into certain things that they can do. Whether it's their how they how everybody's got injuries. Everybody's got. Yeah things are dealing with physically, but also time commitments and, you know, how much they can practice and, mm-hmm. you know, what their goals are. That's, that's really where we always start. It's not going to give you more than you can handle. Yeah. Hopefully. So yeah, it's not definitely not one size fits all. It's uh, the brain part. I mean, it's, I remember when I was working in Chapel Hill the first time when I was just out of school, Dick, Dr. Dick Coop, one of the mm-hmm. best sports psychologists. I've I seen to, him speak. Yeah. I played golf. I bet I played 50 rounds of golf with Dick. Oh, I love that and guy. He was uh, just brilliant. And I always used to tell him, I said, you know, I would like, you need to do a project with me because <laughs> some things are beyond my grasp. So, uh, <laughs> but it was great to just listen to him talk about what, you know, you listen to, you listen to those players. I remember maybe it was at Pinehurst, the last U.S. Open. Bubba comes in and he's doing his pre-tournament press conference. And we all walked out of there and said, well, check him off the list. I mean, you could just listen to him. Like, he's got no chance. Negative, he is, right? He has surrendered to yeah. this place. Yeah. But you listen to Rory and those guys. I mean, a Tiger, I think sometimes. Now, he, he Tiger will now admit when, you know, I just want to play well. You know, it used to be I come here to win. There's no other reason to be here, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and I think he truly believed that. Now, Tiger acknowledges, okay, some weeks are better than others. But you can hear it lots of times in those players and you can see it in their walk. I mean, you see it in Rory as much as anybody. Mm-hmm. That bounce gets a little bigger. Uh, you know, you watch Webb and Webb just looks like he thinks he's going to hit a good shot all the time. He's amazing. Like that he gets he has to be one of the most 
I wouldn't say overachievers, but he gets a lot out of his game, yes. you know, and, and for a long time. I mean, he's been out there forever and going through the anchor band and like the putting problems. Now he's one of the best putters on tour. Yeah, Nobody's done that part better. Than Unbelievable. Yeah. Like I just got mad respect for him. Uh, but yeah, it's a good point about the interviews. I listen to the interviews. I enjoy listening to the, to the post and pre round pre tournament interviews. Cause you can really learn a lot that you can share with your students about self-talk. Right. I mean, you, and you guys see it all the time. Like you said, if you, if the guys are talking negative or they're complaining about, you know, well, the golf course is this or whatever, you can check them off. Right. I mean, it's like they're not going to be their best that week. And Tiger was always great because I'd always share that with my negative students. It's like even when he was playing his worst, he was always I'm working on stuff and I'm close. Mm-hmm. He'd always say that, you know, it's like he, he never, he never said, oh, I just, I just don't have it this week. Or Saturday afternoon, Tiger, you're eight back with one round. Yeah. Two. Well, if I go out early and post a score. Yeah, like, come always. On, come on. But that's what he would say. Yeah. It's funny. You, you watch these guys through the years and you always wonder what are they thinking? What's going through their heads? And per, now as much as ever, but particularly in his prime, Jordan Spieth finally, I mean, he opened that window to us because yeah. he let it all out. So you knew what he was thinking and it was great fun to listen to him because you just, it was unfiltered. I mean, here it came. Yeah. And, you know, even now as he struggles, you just, you just see it. And he'll be back. I hope he gets He'll back. be back. He's got such a good team around him. I mean, Cameron and, you know, his coach. And I mean, I just, he's just too good not to be back. And he's so smart. He's so self aware of his, of his game. And I just feel like he's, you know, and he's not, I mean, we'd love to have his downturns you know what I mean? Like a lot of times we're like, Oh, he's not playing good. Well, shoot. He can't, you know, he can't go through that stretch where he won the masters and he was playing so well for so long there. He just can't keep that up. So he'll be back. He's too young and and too, too good not to be. I'll ask you this because I saw Brandel on Twitter talking about, uh, making the argument. There's not like innate talent that everything is learned, blah, blah, blah. Um, how much, like when you watch Jordan Spieth, but when you watch Crenshaw, I mean, there's a gift somewhere in there that, what is it that you see in those guys that you don't see in the rest of the world? He's talking about like, Put, putters, like Jordan, putters. Jordan not putting well or no, putting well? he putts well, you know, he's back putting well, but I yeah, mean, yeah, but he went through that slump, right? He went through that slump, yeah. I think, yeah. I think he can get too many noises in his head a little bit. Probably. But. Um you know, because you know I teach a lot of putting. So I really think – so that's a great question. Yeah, what makes the best putters? Yeah, it's – you know, there, touch is one of the most difficult things to teach as a putting coach. And I'm not sure there's – anybody has a great answer for it. I mean, we got we all have our favorite drills and, you know, hey, you got to just go do it. But putting is so difficult because the environment changes every single putt. You know, you're, yeah. you get slopes are going different directions. And when we can sit out there and you can make four footers all day, but that doesn't make you a better putter. There's so much, I think adaptation is, is one of the big qualities that, that great putters have. And I think that's where Crenshaw was, was fantastic. If you look at some of the footage when he putted at Augusta, I mean, like he's putting like away from the hole. I mean, his creativity and his vision was amazing. Some of the things that I've been really working with my players on, now is so much more heavily weighted in getting them to adapt and be able to see the picture properly and so much less in mechanics. Not that I don't think mechanics is is important, but not every stroke looks exactly the same. And there's always some, you know, you got to have some face and path control and center contact and, you know, just the basics. But I think I've seen a lot of really great looking, sexy strokes that don't make a lot of putts because they don't have that other piece of it which is just it's what tiger's dad taught him absolutely paint, put, paint, to, put to the picture put to the picture. put to the picture yeah i think that's that's probably the the secret sauce i think that all great putters have had is that i mean whatever you want to call it but it's just I, adaptation i think is is probably the number one characteristic of all, all good putters because i mean we've all had that moment when you walk up there and like oh i'm gonna make this putt. i i just you can practically see the painted line out sure. there just let me Hurry up, y'all! Hurry up, because I need to putt this. And I can only imagine that Crenshaw and Spieth and Tiger and those guys—they saw that all the time. It just felt like they were just going to pour the ball into the hole. Your brain was in the right place too. Like, yeah. and that's the thing that people talking going back to the brain is the interruptions that we get or the negative thoughts that that creep in at the wrong time. People don't realize how important that is. It's not a skill problem. All these guys are reasonably good putters. They wouldn't be at that level. What separates that guy that's 
holding more putts that week than, than the next. It's all the little things in the cracks, right? It's just that being able to see the picture, or putting their intention. I use that word a lot in my putting is, you know, where are you going to stop the ball? And then building that picture backwards is so important that people, they just lose it sometimes. Mm-hmm. They get too caught up in my mechanical thought. Golf swing instead of golf. Yeah, exactly. Putting stroke instead of, instead of just rolling the ball. I remember the first time I ever got to interview Tiger was at 99 Heritage and uh, Lee Patterson was working for the tour and he set it up and I sat in the locker room at Hilton Head with him for about 20 minutes just doing like a QA. and a And one of the questions was, I said, if we could, if I could get inside your head while you're playing, what would it be like? He said, very quiet. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? I don't wow. believe that. <laughs> but that's what he said. He said, it's very quiet. Because I just, I remember thinking later when... I watched him shoot 85 at Memorial or something. <laughs> it's not quiet in there right now. Right. I mean, it's just like rattling around like spare parts in there. So um, it's uh, when you look at players, the top players, who impresses you the most? Um, I mean, you know, obviously distance is a big deal nowadays, right? But I think to me, again, I'm looking at it from a different lens. I'm looking at mechanics. I mean, I love Tommy Fleetwood's golf swing. I mean, that's sort of like if I had to build a golf swing, mm-hmm. that would be that would be sort of my model. I just like the efficiency of it. It's obviously it's fun to watch a DJ drive it or watch. I think Rory's probably got the the prettiest looking, mm-hmm. at most athletic looking golf swing. Um, I think if he had a little bit more, I think if he got back to being the way he was when he was a kid, and people don't re- remember when he. I mean, shoot, I remember watching him when he was like fourteen, fifteen making cuts on the European tour. And he was this little curly head kid that yeah. had an amazing short game. I think if he kind of got back to that a little bit with his, with his wedges and short game, nobody'd beat him and he's getting close. Yeah. I think he, he starts holding his, putts. It, oh my gosh. It, but everybody like, at the top, I think he's the best. Yeah. I, I just think overall he's the most impressive looking game. Yeah. Um, I like Justin Tom. I think. <clears throat> yeah. JT's great. He's, that speed he generates. Um, and gosh, I mean, I can sit and watch Lou Eust, Hazen, and Adam Scott hit golf balls all day long. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's aesthetics versus functionality. But yeah, I kind of like the funky looking swings. You know, like Daniel Berger. I think he's he's a great talent. Kepka's um, a different looking swing. Boy, Kepka's a little different. Yeah. I mean, he definitely exactly. Like again, it's 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 knowing. You know, it's not something you would always teach. Um, but he kind of you know he matches everything up pretty nicely. Who else? Um, I don't know, like the new the new kids coming up are, are really going to be fun to watch. Like, you know, Matty Wolf. God, that's fun to just watch him. Just, right? Just, a, yeah, very unusual looking golf swing. But again, to the teaching lens, there's a lot of stuff that, that I love. Uh, Victor Hovland, one of his teammates. I mean, these kids, are, these kids are just incredible. They're so much more prepared coming out of college than I think players ever were. Yeah, I can't, I, I should remember this now, but I've talked to the Oklahoma State coach I guess it was when Wolf won. Uh, yeah, and I mm-hmm. called him about something, and he said, "You know, the first time I saw him, he was I was like at a European tour event. I mean, amateurs. He's playing somewhere in Europe or something." He said, "I didn't see him hit the ball, but I heard it." Yeah, and it's like, oh, the sound. The sound was different. Yeah, it's yeah. When those guys flush it, it's. You yeah. know, you can tell, like, you really can almost turn your back and tell good players yeah. nowadays because they hit it so, the ball speed's so amazing. Boy, those guys talk about Morikawa. I mean, just. There's another one. Yeah, he's, just he just looks, it. he looks like he's ready to, to win yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, he hits it so close every time or just hits it so straight. I'll tell you, somebody that I really admire, and again, listen, I heard him on a podcast the other day, is Patrick Cantlay. I think that guy. That guy is going to win a lot of golf tournaments. I think he is too. I just think he has the total package. I like his demeanor. He sort of has that little bit of edge. You know, he's sort of, he has that almost like, you know, I really don't care what anybody else thinks about me. I'm just going to mm-hmm. go beat your, beat the crap out of you type mentality. And, but he has the game. He has everything. So that, John, that's one I look, look to see winning a lot more. Yeah. I think John Rom too. I mean, he's so, he, he's so aggressive. Sometimes he might need yeah. to back off. Boy, he's so aggressive with a driver. I mean, it just steps up there and, Fires. Mm-hmm. He's. He, I think. I think Adam Hayes, who lives here, is a perfect tonic for him. Just like, okay, just just keep it here. I I, I could see John Rahm women winning multiple major championships. Mm-hmm. For uh, sure. So, uh, 
What else could I ask you? Um, what's the hardest thing you have to deal with in, with students that you, you know, is there a common thread like, ah, oh, geez, I got this, this person, I got to work through this. Uh, or is it my, I guess what I'm leading to, like a lot of people will come and pay you money to teach them. And then I'm guessing they probably don't listen. Yeah. I would say the, the student that comes and tells me exactly what they think they're doing and basically gives me the golf lesson. Those are the ones that are probably more difficult than anything else. And I, I get, you know, I've been, I've, I've gotten pretty sneaky and figuring out how to show them how much they suck. <laughs> That's good. You know, like, I mean, it's, it's my job, right? It's like you came and paid me cause you're trying to get better, but a lot of them maybe don't ha- they think they want to get better, but they really don't, or they don't want to do the work. That's the other thing is that I don't have any sympathy for the player that wants, that has a too high, ex- too high of expectations and don't want to put in the commitment and the work to get there. So there's a big gap there that there's a big problem that leads to frustration a lot of times that's that's a difficult one because then they get they get mad and then they you know, end up blaming it on me. <laughs> but it's not it's like this game is really really hard. Yes. And I and I I never tell people that it's easy. I just tell them that you you can enjoy enjoy the process. That's the reason why this game is so beautiful because it's nobody's mastered it. You know, even the best players in the world are not consistent. I, I right. always hate that word when people come. I just want to be more consistent. I'm like, what's that mean? There's no, there's no form of consistency, but you can build your skills and you can dive in. I'm a big data guy. So even with average players, I think it's valuable to kind of know what are you doing in each part of your game? Mm -hmm. That way you're not spending time in the wrong area, especially for everybody's working and they have, they don't have time to practice. You need to know where you need to go. And that's my job to do that. How do you get players? And I'm, I'm thinking of someone in this room right now. How do you get <laughs> for, them? asking for a friend? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking for. How do you get them from golf swing to playing golf? I mean, I think Jordan Spieth is playing all golf swing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to spend more time on the golf course with them, playing games. Um, I've switched uh, in the last couple of years. I've switched to more long term coaching programs and even unlimited uh, lesson programs, which has allowed me to spend more time on the golf course with my players. So, I mean, I literally, a lot of times we'll even go out on the golf course and pretend like you're doing the lesson, right? So it's changing the environment mm-hmm. to where they start to have to have to make a, an outcome, right? An outcome is really what causes you to get to golf swing or, you know, so it's like having that fine line of sitting out on the range and hitting to a target all the time is one type of practice, but it doesn't lead all, all the time to the results you want. Cause again, now you're playing golf swing, right? And there's a time for that. Once you start getting some reasonable functionality with your, you know, with your, with your ball flight, then you got to test it. So I'm mm-hmm. constantly testing it. We, um, track man's great. Now the track man four, they have virtual golf. So I'll, if I got a, a lesson that's going pretty well, then I'll switch it over and say, okay, let's put a scorecard in your pocket. Let's mm-hmm. go play. We'll play on the on the on the track man. And it's amazing how people will switch. I mean, yeah. I had a guy the other day, yeah, I was like, he's hitting it great. And I'm like, all right, cool, let's see how let's see how we're really doing. So I turned on the virtual golf. Let's go play Muirfield. All of a sudden he just starts hitting it all over the place. Really? Well, yeah. It's like, what happened? Yeah. That's a mental thing, right? I mean, yeah. it wasn't the skills are there, but he now he started thinking too much about the wrong things. And so you gotta teach them how to switch that mentality of like, all right, now let's get back into your routine picking your targets. Uh, Decade's been a big, big help. Scott, shout out to Scott Fawcett. We talk about him a lot on this podcast, but course management, right? If you're focused on a target, then you're not going to be as likely to think so much about the swing thoughts. You're more involved with the process. I remember we were talking to Kepka and like, what do you do before a shot? He goes, I just want one thing. I want to know how far it is short and long. And then I go hit it. I just, I don't think about anything else. Short and long is all yeah. I worry about. And, you know, I'm sure they, that's simplified, but. Yeah. And he's looking at the picture. He's, but, like, he's, he's out there. He's looking at his ball flight and he's. I've tried know. to think sometimes stand over shot. Like now Kepka would just say, just, just hit. You're just trying to hit it. There, and then just yeah. go hit it there. And it works sometimes. But yeah. uh, if you can declutter it. Uh, but there, there's a lot of clutter that comes with the game sometimes. Yeah, and I, I think you know I'm not a big fan. I'm not. I'm not. Say, I'm not saying you don't need swing thoughts because I think you do. I think you need to have a couple. Mm-hmm. 
That's a, it's a tough question. It's one, it's a, you know, we've been talking about this for a hundred years, right? How do we, how do we get that range? How, how do we not be Ranger Rick? Right. I always tell that the story, I think it was, uh, the year who won the, who won the British open, uh, who won it that year. I can't remember it. I think it was at Muirfield several years ago. Anyway, Tiger did an interview, listened to his interview because I had one of the best range warm up sessions ever. I hit every sign on the range and he went out and shot 77. Mm. <laughs> Right, and then the 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 other the other side of it was I think just recently maybe in the fall when JT won he won one of his tournaments because I had mm-hmm. the absolute worst yeah. rain session before I warmed up yeah. couldn't find it goes out and wins a tournament or goes out and shoots sixty three or something that day or whatever but I mean you just don't you know you just don't yeah. know but the good ones sort of have that ability to turn it on and off a little bit yeah it's uh I remember what you talking about with JT. Um, I just, uh, it, it's trying to teach a game like this. What's the biggest reward for you? Uh, cause it doesn't take, I mean, I could go play one of the best rounds of golf for 17 holes and I make one mess of it. That's what I'm going to think about. What, what do you get the most satisfaction from? It's, I mean, it, it's really just that student that, you know, I get that text message, Hey, click today. I shot the best round of my life or or I just I played better. I mean, it was just about helping other people achieve their goals. I mean, it, pretty simple i mean it's really just pleasing people and making them making them happy and enjoy the game a little bit more i mean it can become it can come in so many different forms it's not always just shooting their career low yeah it's like hey i you know i hit this career shot today like i mean it could be one shot right but just a glimpse of progress i think is is probably the the big thing but it during a lesson, it's the aha moment right it's just that it's just when they hit that shot and they say i felt it i got it i understand you know, that's the, that's sort of the thing that gets me going and gets me out of bed in the morning. It's just, but for me, it's like figuring out how do I get that out of the student that, like you said, everybody's different. My, all my lessons look different because I got to find that button to push or that drill to give or that cue to give. Now it's, <laughs> that's a lot different now yeah. since I can't, cause I'm a big grabber. I like to get in there and move people around. And so it's been kind of interesting the last few weeks of standing back and having to either demonstrate whether I'm just sort of making swings or I'll get up and hit a shot or I mean, we use video and track man, obviously. Mm-hmm. So it's just using some other cues to, to get to the goal. You were asking me about influences. Who are the two or three influences that you have, that have sort of led you to this? Oh God, there's, there's so many because now, I mean, nowadays with, um, you know, with social media and, and all the relationships that I've sort of built over the years, like I feel like I've taken a little piece of so many people I mean, obviously Dana was a huge influence because mm-hmm. I worked for her for 11 years. And I mean, I can't thank her enough for just giving me an opportunity yeah. to be a, a part of that program. And that really molded my career. So she's she's number one. And so much, so much more than just like teaching me how to teach golf. I mean, it was just, she was such a mentor for my, for my life. Chuck Evans has been a big influence for me. There's been so many, like, you know, just from afar, right? Like Jim McClain, I mean, Hank Haney, some of these guys that just, you know, I, I may not have like directly learned from them, but it's just like you take, I read everybody's book, you know, you yeah. kind of take something from them. I've watched people teach, but there's so many people now that are sort of like my age or in my generation that have influenced me, like James Ridyard for the short game and John Graham for putting and, you know, Phil Kenyon for putting and, you know, these guys that I've been fortunate enough to call friends and, and steal all of their stuff <laughs> and, and teach it, you know, I mean, yeah. it's just, and you know, and you sort of develop your own style, but I mean, just the, I, the list could go on and on and on. There's so many people. Do you, so do you trade messages or, you know, talk to them, certain people regularly and sort of compare notes or yeah, uh, get, get an idea from, Hey, I'm trying to work with this one guy. I can't quite figure out anything like that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, and that's what started this podcast really was the fact that again, I have so many great friends that are willing to pick the phone up when I call Mark Blackburn, big, big influence on me, John Tattersall. And I was like, well, shoot, why can't we just share this with the world and maybe help some younger coaches out there get better? Um, yeah, we're constantly, you know, James Hong. I mean, golly, there's so many, so many people I don't want to make my list cause I'll lose somebody out, but yeah, we're constantly text messaging each other, sending each other videos. Hey, what do you think about this or questions 
on the phone we can and the PGA show is basically just the biggest teaching summit yeah. <laughs> in the country because we all get together and and we stay stay in each other's condos and then we do you know we're speaking and attending each other's seminars and stuff like that yeah so it's been it's it's such a small world now you know with social media and the internet that you know brought us all together and people are all over the country I mean I got like guys like Dana Dahlquist that have been on the show I mean guys that are you know out out in, on the west coast that we're always talking or texting or something. Gankus, <laughs> you, yeah. you know, Gankus, you know, I've sort of got to right. know him and um, he's been on the show. So, I mean, we've all, uh, I think, sort of influenced each other and hopefully they've taken a few things from me as well. And now you've got, with no tournament golf, I've watched Padraig Harrington give me lessons and I watched yeah. Luke Donald have me put my hand on the wall <laughs> yesterday or something and yeah. drop my elbow or something. You're right. Like, okay, something else to think about. So now you got more competition. Well, it's just, I think people are just trying to, trying to give back, you know? I mean, it's, I mean, my friends, like we're not on lockdown yet, but it's coming and I'll be putting out, I'm sure more, I put out a lot of content anyways on Instagram or, Mm -hmm. you know, people can go, go to my Instagram page and basically watch me give a lesson or see some of my students. And so, yeah, it's great to see a lot of my friends that are just, you know, Hey, let's turn the camera on and let's, you know, let's get better. It's like virtual, right? I mean, we're all, we're, we're going to probably go to FaceTime lessons and, Send, I mean, my students send me videos all hours of the night anyway, so it's not, that's nothing new. But we'll definitely uh, utilize technology to wow, keep a- everybody keep everybody like you know involved in, in thinking about their golf swings. Because again, I've never been busier right now. Really? Oh yeah, my my book is full. Our golf course is full. But again, I think we know kind of what's coming. Yeah, let's hope we somehow avoid it. But I think we know what's coming. Yeah. So if it comes. I need one drilled in my office, one putting drill in my office, and that's slow. But uh, uh, for those of us, all I want to do is hit putts in the center every time. Give me, what's, a, what's a nice – when I hit them in the center, well, then I never account for flush, so it always goes past the hole. But Yeah, well, yeah. It's a, I mean, I would say I would go and get Phil Kenyon's uh, training aid, the Vizio mat. Have you ever seen that? It just basically shows the, the arc of the I, putt, right? Yeah, I know the one you're talking Probably about. Probably my favorite – uh, training aid for putting just because it forces the student to actually do it it's not like you're putting it up against something not a, nothing against those training aids but i just like it because it makes the player do it but i'd say the i always tell the, my students the number one skill in putting is be able, being able to stop the ball where you want to stop it yeah so i do so many drills that don't involve a hole because i think if you can develop that skill and then you have some sort of idea about green reading then the hole just captures the golf ball it sort of is a byproduct of all of all of the putting it to the edge of the putting it exactly like yeah my favorite drill is probably just putting to like a quarter or a poker chip so that would be the one if i had Mm -hmm. to give one drill that would be it would be that one just learn how to stop the ball where you want to stop now obviously if you're if your carpet's too slow and it's only about as wide as this room so it may not be if it's rolling at a six it may not be the best does it count if it bounces off the wall and comes back? Clear? I don't think so, but yeah, that's oh, the, that would that. be that would be the thing. It, it's it's I'm impressed by what you can do and how. I mean, because as you know, standing on the side with the club in your hand, you just sometimes it seems so easy, and sometimes it feels endlessly complicated. Yeah, and, and you get to that point where this is never ever gonna. I don't know where to start to fix it, and then other times it's just like well, just what happened today? You know, you just, you're above the clouds and it's just smooth. We got to get your chipping straight. That's the thing. That if you... I, I, I would like to worry about my chipping, but it's more than that. <laughs> I hit the high Healy spinny <laughs> shot all the time now. I'm like, that's, I think the, I'm right. I'm walking now, but lately it's been like, boy, these carts are fast. I'm already to my tee shot. <laughs> so yeah, I need to come see you. All right. We'll definitely, we'll definitely get that going. Man, this has been, this has been great. This has been a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, everybody out there has enjoyed listening to, enjoyed it. To, 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 a, to a legend uh, no, in the, no. in the golf world and the journalism sports writers uh, space. So you have to answer one question. Everybody has to answer this question Uh-oh. that comes on the podcast and you can give it some thought. I'll give you a second, but if you, if you could have a gigantic billboard and put, one message that would get out to into the t- entire world and it couldn't be more important than now because everybody's holed up. What would that message be? It can be a quote, 
mantra, any words that Ron Green lives by? Hmm. Hmm. I see Coach Smith over there on the wall peering down at me. So what would Coach Smith? Now, I don't know. The thing that comes to mind is just treat other people the way you'd like to be treated yourself. It Golden rule. It solves so many, answers every question, doesn't it? Or it should. Yeah, I think that's great. So, uh, I, I mean, yeah, it's not original, but it, it works. That's okay. That's a that's a great way to close. And, and like I said, thank you so much for, for coming well, on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Any, any uh platforms or websites you want to give out to, to I know yeah. you're on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, at Ron Green Jr. I don't tweet as much as I should. I probably need to do more of that. Uh, I've not yet done the Instagram thing, but I have a 20 year old daughter and my wife keeps telling me, you got to do Instagram. Um, uh, so I, I need to do that. Uh, our global golf com website will get you the, you can sign up for the magazine. We'll send Absolutely. it to you. Um, those are the main ones. Uh, and, and listen to your podcast. What's up, everybody? Thank you Peter, so much. We're back here again thank with you. a couple Appreciate of things it. before you jump off. Uh, first, big thank you to Ron for coming on the show and sharing his story and his knowledge and insights of the game. I know they're going to be super valuable going forward for all of you out there. And it was just a, such a fun conversation. Uh, make sure you follow Ron on Twitter at Ron Green Jr. and give him a social wave and say thank you. Uh, also, check out Global Golf Post and subscribe to his newsletter and read his outstanding work as he is one of the best in the in the in the business for sure uh, thank you again for our sponsors envyedhemp.com and make sure you use the promo code guru20 for your 20 percent discount for life make sure you go to the app store and download my app the golf guru app and check out my website at golfgurutv.net where you can find videos articles and more information on my teaching and coaching if you have a question or comment for the show, you can DM me. Appreciate that. Or you can email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com. Uh, this show and all episodes of the Golf Guru Show were produced by myself, Jason Sutton. Music is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And as I leave you with, always, RIP Mr. Jim Rohn, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening.